<clears throat> okay, so um, I just um, am extremely privileged um, to have a special guest who's joining us for the Asclepian Project Conference today at St. Catharines. I have um, Edward Tick, and I just want to give you a little bit of information about Edward, he's a psychotherapist since 1975. He is a Greek scholar and a multi-faith chaplain. He's a non-fiction writer and poet. Um, he's also done groundbreaking work on PTSD with veterans. He's based in America um, and of his books, he's written five non-fiction books and three poetry books. Now, I only heard about uh, um, Edward Tick quite recently, which is my fault really, because I wish I'd discovered him earlier. And um, he is literally probably the most knowledgeable person I know when it comes to knowledge about Asclepians. And during the course of this um, little interview, hopefully he will outline that to you. So welcome, Ed, it's so lovely to see you today. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, welcome to you, welcome to all of our friends and colleagues meeting today, and I'm really honored and pleased to be with you and to be with everyone. So uh, shall I just begin talking? Yeah, so if you begin to tell us how you stumbled across the concept of Asclepians and then maybe give us an overview of Asclepians because many of us here it's a really new word for us. So I guess the first part is how you came across them in the first place. The second part would be an overview of Asclepians and I guess the third it would be how you envisage it, envisage it as a useful model for holism in modern day healthcare. Okay, well, thank you for all this and I will do my best to uh, provide a lot of this information in a tantalizing way in a very short time for oh. now. And hopefully uh, enough of us will be interested in this to meet and speak again in the future. So uh, to begin, uh, I, it is accurate that I'm very familiar with Asclepius as the ancient Greek god of healing and the tradition of the Asclepian sanctuaries, which are the origins of medicine and psychology in the Western world. And the, this tradition represents the very beginning where medicine, psychology, psychiatry began in the Western world and eventually developed into the scientific fields that we have today. Uh, I've been working in this field for about 40 years, and I discovered it because in my areas of specialization, uh, psychology and healthcare uh, were, were really failing in the task of bringing significant healing to the, the patient's suffering. So first I want to say that I have been using this, studying this practice since, um, my own initiation into it in 1987. And I've been using the practices since uh, I studied it after 1987 and my own initiation, I continued to study um, spiritual and holistic and community-based dimensions of healing intensively well ever since. But then in 1995, I felt familiar enough with this tradition so that I began leading pilgrimages using the Asclepian healing tradition in Greece. And I also do it through retreats and workshops in the US and elsewhere around the world. But I have been actually using the tradition since 1995. So we're talking about almost 30 years of practice in this. And uh, we're together with my patients and some other health practitioners, we have facilitated healings that we would consider miraculous and that modern medicine says are impossible. So we don't have enough time to give you full clinical stories now, but I want to mention uh, in the book uh, Sabina has, The Practice of Dream Healing, uh, I do give the case study. Thank you. Uh, I tell in that book the entire history of the Asclepian tradition from its founding uh, uh, around 1500 BC, all the way through its development to scientific medicine under Hippocrates and the Greek Enlightenment, like 400 BC, and its continued development until it disappeared around 500 AD. So we had this health tradition, holistic and spiritually based health tradition for 2000 years before it was suppressed and eventually destroyed by early Christianity. 
Uh, some Jungians began to bring it back at the end of World War II. So it did come back there and actually came back through clinical practice that revealed this tradition to people, uh, Jungian, early Jungian practitioners who didn't know it. Um, and then uh, with my work in this tradition, uh, I am one of the few people who has studied this and practiced it comprehensively and now for decades. I we don't have time for full case studies, but I do wanna tell you the very first case that I present in dream healing was a man who had uh, hemochromatosis and he was diagnosed as terminally ill. By the time he had, we went to Greece together, he was having a pint of blood drawn every couple of weeks just to drain off the iron rich blood that his body could not process. And he was told he only had a few years to live. Okay. This, we went to Greece in, together in 1987 on my first Escapian journey. And we did holistic practices, including what this tradition called dream incubation, which is, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, through this process and through the extraordinary transformational dream work that this man had, his body changed the way he carries his hemochromatosis. So he was not gonna be alive for more than another three or four years. And I'm happy to tell you that now 87, 90, almost 30 years later, he's thriving, he's oh. well. Uh, his medical expert practitioners can't explain it. All they can say is, we didn't know this disease went into remission, but you're okay. He only has his blood tested once every three to six months. So he had a full healing where his body rebalanced how it carries this chronic disease such that he's not breaking down from it anymore. It's not an active disease. And it came through this Escapian dream healing tradition. A second case I would present to you at length will be, would be the healing of a veteran with severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and in his case, again, I can't tell the whole story, but we had several steps in his holistic healing practices that included a ritual of visiting an ancient warrior cemetery, a ritual of having him stand where the ancient warriors stood and give, tell his entire story that he had never told before and declare himself from being an angry Vietnam veteran who doesn't even want to be a veteran to declare himself a spiritual warrior in the ancient tradition whose service was in Vietnam. So through this tradition, he had a major shift in his identity such that it enabled him to carry the wounding without traumatic breakdown. Yeah. And then we also practice a dream incubation where all night long, he was torn apart by combat nightmares, which is a common symptom of PTSD. We know that. But when he woke up at dawn, and I was sitting with him when he woke up, he woke up with this brilliant light coming through his eyes and his face and a huge smile and said, it's over, I'm done. This was more than a decade ago, and he has not had another combat nightmare since. We use this tradition to finish emptying his psyche from all of the war trauma that was locked in there that was he was still carrying. There's a beautiful quote in your book between the, the soul and the body. Can you recap that for our audience? Hippocrates said, so we're back to about 400 BC. So 2,400 year old wisdom, Hippocrates said, all illnesses begin in the soul and end in the body. He also said that our small mistakes and sins every day by which we ignore our health needs eventually accumulate over time and they develop into our illnesses. So we have soul wounds, we're ignoring them. They're getting worse. They're developing into physical symptomatology and we don't even know it until they finally explode into full-blown symptoms and we have uh, some kind of holistic condition that's expressing itself through the body. So mm -hmm. in this practice and this philosophy, our symptoms are not 
just troubling conditions to reduce or eradicate through medication and control so we can live normal, semi well-adjusted lives to an unsatisfying reality as all of us are doing today. Rather, this tradition teaches that our symptoms are soul talk. Our symptoms are trying to tell the sufferer and our, us as practitioners what this person's soul is suffering to speak to us uh, when words have failed, previous symptoms of uh, symptomatology has not given us the attention to our soul wounds that we need. So we as practitioners need to learn to listen so deeply and metaphorically and symbolically and kind of psychomythologically so that we hear what the symptom is trying to say so that we can treat the whole person rather than just eradicate the symptom. This is another principle of ancient medicine is listen to the person carrying the disease and help that person through a soul history understand why they have developed this disease rather than listen to the disease and treat the disease so that the person can function better. That's backwards. Yeah, absolutely. So these are Asclep there was about 300 Asclepian healing centers in Europe, I understand. And I also understand they're in beautiful settings because just nature itself helped with the healing. Can you tell us a little bit more about these ancient Asclepians and how they helped achieve real healing in a holistic way? Yes. Uh, today, we still have some holistic healing sanctuaries around. I don't know what's in the UK, but... Uh, there, there's the spa, the famous uh, spas in Germany and in, in Austria, where people go for significant holistic healing. In the U.S., we have many holistic healing sanctuaries. However, peop when people go to them, they usually get just one or two treatment modalities. They're very expensive, and I'll go to a, a, a holistic center and I'll take a week of yoga classes, but I won't get all of the modalities. In ancient Asclepian holistic sanctuaries, you're right that we know of over 320 of them that were all over the Mediterranean world in ancient times. And people traveled from great distances to be in them. And briefly, this is how they worked. They were perfect holistic sanctuaries. They had uh, hydrotherapy and acupressure and psychotherapy and dream work and um, theater for, for psychodrama and nutrition and gymnastics and immersion in nature. And you're right, they were always in beautiful places. So people were in nature and experienced the, the healing powers of nature. And all of these and others, there was hydrotherapy. I don't know if I mentioned that there was color therapy. A depressed person might be put into a room painted all in yellow walls, floor, ceiling. You're gonna stay in the light to, in, uh, for days to penetrate the depressed mood that you're in and change it from, from black to yellow. Uh, so a person would come into the sanctuaries. Everybody was welcome, men and women, old and young, free and slave. Even slaves were welcome and protected in these sanctuaries. And they were free for everybody. You only gave an offering afterwards for the healing. So an emperor would build a, a new building. A slave would give an apple. It's enough. Whatever you have, the divine accepts your gift is what you can give. And people stayed as long as they needed. It wasn't a day or a week or you're in the hospital, let's get you back as out into the world as quickly as possible. All right, next, the key to healing was not even the application of the holistic uh, practices, the complementary and alternative practices that we might say today. The key to the healing was you stay in the sanctuary for as long as needed until you had some kind of dream or visitation or vision or indication that you were called to approach Asclepius, the god of healing. 
And at that time, you went into a special building that was reserved for nothing else but what was called dream incubation. So the physician priests, people were both at the time, the physician priests were in attendance to the patient nonstop while the patient slept on, the couch was called a clinicos, our word clinic comes from this tradition. Yeah. And a patient just rested, fasted, slept, dreamed, waited for visions, people got energy healing, and it could be hours, it could be days, but they stayed in the clinicos just waiting until they had a dream or a vision that came from Asclepius, the god of healing, or any of his helpers. He had three daughters who were also healers, and we get some of our healing words from them. Uh, Panacea was one daughter. Uh, so we all healing. Uh, Yaso was another daughter, which meant doctor. And um, Ihia was the other daughter. She was one of the main healers. And we get a word hygiene from her. Yeah. So hygiene, doctoring, and all giving were the names of the daughters. And any one of them might come in a dream and bring healing as well. Also, the animal represent the totems of Asclepius, which were the, especially the snake, and that's where we get the caduceus from, but also the dog and the rooster, the cock. Any of these could come in dreams and visions, and people experience either being healed in, directly in the dream or being given the prescription for how to heal themselves. We have the records of thousands of these that have been translated from the ancient Greek. And we know this tradition lasted for about 2000 years in both Greek and Roman eras. And it was even adopted in early Christian era. And there were some dream incubations done in the Christian tradition, uh, replacing Asclepius with Jesus or the saints. But people still incubated in the early churches and they waited for dreams and visions that healed them. So holistic uh, bringing your wound that nothing else is healed into this tradition, into these sanctuaries, being completely accepted without any stress or payment or pain into the sanctuary for as long as you needed and nurtured with great attention, with the arts, with all of the different complementary healing methods to get you as strong as possible, then entering a sacred dream chamber to have some kind of, through dreams and visions, an encounter with divine represent, representatives who come and either give the actual healing in the dream experience, uh, as both of the people that I re referenced, uh, the men with hemochromatosis and the combat veteran, both had profound healings through their dreams. And we just had to integrate and process and integrate them afterwards but we didn't have to do the healing work. It had happened in their dream life and in seriously, in thoroughly reordering and reorganizing their psychic structures so that their souls were healed and they were carrying their afflictions in a, and processing them in their bodies in a completely different way. So, and so this and then, does sound like a beautiful nirvana and to a degree mythologically based. How can we conceive this as a useful model of holism in the modern day? And maybe talk a little bit about some practical methods. There are very, very many practical methods. Oh, one thing, of course, is in how we educate our doctors and how, um, health pro professionals and teach us, teach our colleagues how to work with patients. You're working with a human being, you're not working with the disease. Is it a human being will the illness? You have to talk holistically about to the person and learn how their life has developed this condition, not just treat the condition. We have to work holistically and use every methodology that might help and relieve and soothe the condition. It's not uh, one size doesn't fit all, one answer never if it's a solution, and we have to stop relying primarily on medications. 
Hippocrates also taught that. This is, comes from this tradition as well. He said, um, well, he said, leave your chemicals in the laboratory pot and use food for your medicine instead. Fabulous. So make your food your medicine and your medicine your food and reduce the, our dependency on, on, uh, on, our che on chemistry. So there's that too. Uh, archetypal teachers, uh, Carl Jung and James Hillman and, and my work, we teach taking soul histories, not just case histories. Expand the concept of case history to everything that the person has ever experienced. Also, when we use all of the complementary methods and the expressive and creative arts as much as possible. Excellent. Uh, to, so people are working on their, in their inner lives and their souls and what has created and what is manifesting their conditions and return really serious and comprehensive dream work such as we've practiced in the sanctuaries. When I lecture on this in medical schools, the medical students have always been fascinated by this. And they've asked their faculty, can we please have courses on the medical use of dreams? Dreams can help us with diagnosis and prognosis and uh, treatment uh, planning and execution. And every time faculty have said, yeah, well, this is interesting, but it's not scientific. And we don't have any time in our curriculum for intuitive, imaginal, non-scientific studies. Wrong. We are spiritual and psychological and creative as well as scientific and biological beings. And introducing dream work and dream analysis and study into our medical uh, curriculum and practices would help greatly. And my dream is that we could even go so far as to have um, clinics in, in hospitals and healthcare centers that are incubation centers where people come in and really do this with trained and experienced and, uh, facilitators, do this really intensive, deep uh, guided journey into their dream world so that we can access everything that is stored in the unconscious and has been cooking in the soul and become aware of it, externalize it and transform the way we carry it so that we can finally rearrange our inner world and relieve our diseased conditions. Wow, and do you think that realistically in some of these, let me say more constrained healthcare systems that we could genuinely do this? Yes, it needs modern people, especially modern practitioners, having a great deal of courage to step out of the boxes in which we are constrained now. Uh, so sure, I can easily imagine that well, our hospitals have auditoriums for medical training, right? Let's use our auditoriums for um, sacred theater, for psychodrama. We can we have the facility, but we need the practitioners willing to do it. As one example, uh, we we could teach as uh, Asclepius as the healing god was also called the listener, just the listener. The listener. Yeah. We need to teach our medical professionals how to really do deep listening. I'm sorry, but to all of our friends and colleagues, that means taking time with patients. It doesn't mean a 10 minute med check. It means an hour of really, how are you? And what has changed since we've been together? And how is our relationship impacting you? And do you Feel me caring about you? And are you receiving love and support? And do you have a community of support? And let's look at where you are in your health and illness process and if it's changing and how your whole life is shaping this. So we have to learn how to practice deep listening and we would have to reorient our healthcare systems to be primarily patient-centered rather than profit motive. Uh, driven. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Now we're going to have to wind down, but just before we recorded this interview, you, you corrected me on something, and it was a beautiful correction, actually. And that's that quite often we um, refer to holism as mind, body and spirit. And I just wanted you to, to recap on your definition of, of holism, obviously including the fact that you've just mentioned the word love, um, and we very rarely use that word um, when we're talking about holism. So it'd be good for you to just maybe summarize your definition of holism. Sure, and thank you for that. In my um, over 40 years of clinical practice, uh, I have been striving all the time uh, to open myself and our concepts as widely as possible to be as complete so that uh, we really are whole uh, or re uh, putting ourselves back together as whole human beings. And so most holistic practitioners refer to themselves as working with mind, body, spirit, and that's good and better than uh, the mainstream, but it's really, it's not holistic yet. So in my attempt to achieve a, a full definition of holism, I call it uh, treating mind, body, heart, and spirit in community and with transcendent meaning. We need to put the heart back in, and you, thank you, educated me that the Muslim tradition teaches that the mind is in the heart, not the brain, and that unifies us with the Hippocratic teachings, which said the same thing 2000 years ago. The heart, the mind is here and we guide from here. And when we're primarily coming from the brain, uh, we've cut off our emotions. We've cut off the center of our being. Uh, we're not feeling love, back to love. Uh, and we need to be motivated by love and guided by the heart. Also, we heal in community. And our afflictions are communal. The social and historical political conditions we're living in make, are making us all ill. And we all need to be together in community, healing uh, together. And we need transcendent purpose. It's not enough to say, oh, okay, I'm better now, but it doesn't really have any purpose uh, to my society or to the universe. I'm just living my own life. We need, we always need transcendent meaning. So that's my more striving for more uh, holistic definition of holism. That's what I've arrived at and include all of those in my practices. Thank you so much, Ed. I could talk to you for hours, but I'm, I'm going to stop the recording now. And I'm hoping that you will have stimulated a lot of thoughts in our audience. And I'm hoping one day we'll be in a position to invite you to the UK and talk to us further about this. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you very much. And greetings to all of my colleagues there. Thank you all for your interest in this. And uh, can I just strongly suggest that for those of you interested, really interested in exploring and perhaps uh, participating in this tradition to look at my two books on this, because they really are uh, the most comprehensive books in our, in this specialty in our field that we have today. So the practice of dream healing, which came out in 2001. So I've been doing the work ever since. And then just this January, a new book called Soul Medicine was just published. And that covers also the 20 years of work in this field I've done since dream healing and even more developments and more uh, ancient practices that are being revived today for our holistic and psycho-spiritual healing together. So thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.